Okay, so welcome everybody. So today you have Lucas Martins. He did his PhD in, in Sao Paulo in EFT. EFT. Then he visits Perimeter Institute uh, in Canada. And now he's here visiting us, visiting us for a few months. So please, Lucas, go on. Okay, thank you. So um, first I want to uh, thanks for the opportunity of giving this talk and the hospitality of the Institute. It's been great to work here with Thiago Fleury and Denis Zavaleta. So uh, today I'm going to talk about a topic which is, uh, I think it's misunderstood because it's of its poor communication. I'm going to talk about the first quantization of relativistic systems and uh, two particular objects that will caught our attention. So first I will review uh, quantization of non-relativistic systems. That's just to fix language, just to everyone understand what I'm talking about. And then I'm going to talk about first quantization of relativistic systems. And then there will be these two particular objects that will be special, that will be the superstring and topological string. I'm going to comment some applications of these two objects in our current understanding of theoretical physics. And uh, then I'm going to conclude. And if there is time, I, I would also discuss uh, something else called double copy, which is something orthogonal to this, but uh, it, it, it corroborate the point I want to make. So, uh, okay, so first I'm going to review the quantization of the relativistic systems. Uh, so according to Galileo, physical systems are described by defects moving inside Euclidean space. Newton assumes that this motion is differentiable, uh, but it's not entirely true experimentally. And Heisenberg come up with a, with a way to fix for that and introduce the Planck constant in the right place. And then uh, Dirac improved this language uh, where he essentially assigned to physical systems or objects uh, Hilbert space. And then to the idea of motion, he replaced it by morphisms. Uh, so let me just write down something. Uh, I think it, it's good. Uh, so when you consider, th there are two things you can consider. So you can consider uh, a map between two different types of Hilbert spaces, or you can consider a map uh, that preserves the Hilbert space, okay? So these types of maps are more boring because there's not so much things you can study uh, except kernels, uh, imagey, co-kernel, and so on. Uh, but these uh, types of maps, uh, there's something more interesting, which is uh, spectrum. And those are the symmetries. Okay, uh, so this uh, objects, the super spaces, they are not just vector spaces, but they are equipped with a positive definite norm uh, or emission metric. And uh, symmetries must preserve this emission metric, so they must be uh, unitary uh, transformations. Uh, okay, so. Um, so the basic thing you want to compute is this, which is a probability uh, of a transition between an in state to an out state. Uh, I like to write down this as a trace. And indeed, uh, that shows that uh, everything in quantum mechanics can eventually be translated into traces. So you can compute everything in terms of traces. So states are mapped to projectors. Indeed, if you do that, you don't need to worry about uh, why you're computing amplitudes instead of probabilities, the equation two kind of answer this question. So uh, the language of Hubert spaces, there are two basic operations, direct sums and tensor products. So uh, the direct sum is cor corresponding natural language to the word war, like uh, I'm going to give an example. And then the tensor products corresponds to the word N in natural language. So for example, if H plus denotes the one dimensional Hubert space associated with the spin plus one half, and h minus then those the one dimensional Hilbert space associated with the spin minus one half. A system with spin plus one half or minus one half is described by the Hilbert space in equation four. While a system of spin plus one half and minus one half is described by the Hilbert space of equation five. Note that both space has two dimensions. 
because here you you need to decide which come first. So you don't. You just put that R, but R is a direct sum. Okay. So restoring the continuous motion. So even though motion is observed experimentally to be no smooth, no experiment rules out the assumption that motion is continuous. And the idea of continuous motion is somehow obscure in the language of Hilbert spaces, but it was nevertheless formulated by Dirac and then improved by Feynman by extending the ideas of Wiener. Wiener was studying Brownian motion. So it consists of interrupting the unitary evolution by many resolutions of the identity. So uh, let me just write down a picture. So uh, traces can be write down some kind of a, a circle because of the cyclicity of the trace and then insertions on the trace are like points. Uh, and if you get in, in, in unitary operators, like they, they are lines. So get some kind of a geometrical picture li li like this. Um, sorry. Yes, uh, and then uh, if you want to turn this into a continuous motion, or if you want to see it, uh, you interrupt these unitary uh, transformations, which are these lines, by a bunch of of projectors. But some of over complete bases of projectors. So here I'm using complete instead of over complete just to, to make things more easy. But one can extend to over complete basis. There's no so much of a problem. Uh, and you, if you do that, uh, you end up with equation six. Uh, sorry. Oh, okay. You end up with equation six. And this results in a reformulation that help us localize classical mechanical structures within quantum mechanics. So uh, as you make this interruption fine and finer, we eventually end up with, uh, with equation seven, where this object here just, I mean, it's kind of tri trivial algebra, just because exponent of A exponent of B is equal exponent of A plus B. If A and B commutes, uh, we get um, that equation seven we we'll construct a, an exponent of i over h bar d tau uh, p tau which is the action so uh, the action will appear uh, quite naturally that's a class correction uh, so this result language, uh, now is keeping some details. We'll separate various parameters into backgrounds or complings and dynamical fields, proceeding with the path integral, which is an equation eight. So essentially, because you get this infinite uh, number of, of resolutions of the, the, the identity by projectors, you get a bunch of sums. So what you are essentially doing is instead of summing and then multiplying, you are multiplying first and then you sum. When you do that, you end up with equation eight or whatever equation eight means because mathematically it is not well defined. Um, but uh, the physical idea is that uh, equation eight is like a, a, an integral over dynamical fields with, uh, a, with a measure in the space on, uh, on the space of dynamical fields. And the things you can do is to deform this measure and how physics are obtained by deformations of this measure. So notice that here there's an I in front of the action. So if you want to maintain unitarity, uh, it must be, you must deform this measure in some particular way. So the action must be real, for example. Uh, but one can, of course, imagine deforming the theory outside unitarity and uh, one can describe systems in thermal baths and so on. Uh, so the second quantization, okay, so now I'm going to talk about second quantization, uh, which is uh, when you let the number of copies of a physical system to be dynamical. So uh, examples are Fermi liquids, Bose-Einstein and condensates, and Maxwell field. We allow for duplicates to appear, disappear, and perhaps interact. 
the Hamiltonian of the second quantization is related to the Hamiltonian of the first quantization in equation nine. So you see uh, that this term here, um, it, it uh, imposes constraints on the second quantized Hamiltonian. So there'll be deformations that cannot be written like this, cannot be absorbed by redefinitions of H1 ST. So uh, in a sense, uh, second quantization is a generalization of first quantization because it allows you to dis discuss more dynamics that you can discuss before. So uh, the Hubert spaces are related by a far construction. So here I'm abusing a little bit of notation. So what actually this numbers means is that I'm, I'm dividing uh, this uh, uh, tensor products by some action of the symmetry uh, of the symmetry group. So I'm so for instance I can this split into bosons and fermions. Uh, but uh, the essential idea of equation ten is that of an exponentiation, right? So okay. So now that the language is quite fixed, I'm going to uh, discuss the first quantization of relativistic systems. Uh, so what does reaching for the light manifest in quantum mechanics? So experimentally, Galilean symmetry is broken as we try to reach for the light. That's due to Einstein and Michael Morley. Uh, the Euclidean symmetry, ISO3, however, is preserved. And it fits nicely in a compact subgroup of ISO 1,3, which is the Poincaré group. This group is not manifest in descriptions that distinguish space from time, because time is relative. And uh, this work in, in 68, uh, they describe it, this relativistic systems in, uh, in, a, in, a, in a description uh, where space and time are indeed splitted, Poincaré symmetry is not manifest, and they use Hubert's link, uh, Hubert space language. So it, it turns out that, uh, more technically, the unitary representations of the SO1, 3 subgroup is described by comp by a complicated SO3 or SO2 rotations depend on if you're describing massive or massless particles respectively, uh, that depends on the momentum. So one can imagine uh, that this is going to be, be very ugly computationally speaking. So one cannot do too much things with this description. So uh, uh, as we attempt to manifest the point uh, symmetry, uh, a new symmetry previously hidden from us emerged. And this symmetry is the BRC symmetry. And that's uh, 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 it's well discussed in Siegel and Zuiba paper in eight to seven. Uh, they actually as they they're discussing super string theory and and um, not just super string but string theories in general and second quantization of string theories. But it turns out that uh, this role of of BRC symmetry, uh, fortunately, was on, was first uh, was perceived by string theorists and this. It's not so popular, so not everyone knows about this importance of BRC symmetry, which is more general. It's, it's not special for string theory, but covers particle physics and field theory more general. So, uh, why BRC symmetry appears? So, when you try to describe relativistic system uh, in a way that is covariant, uh, the way to do it is by modeling the system as an embedding in a space-time. Now, space and time are unified, and you put something there, uh, but em embeddings comes with invariances. They, they come with repermization variance, and the physics must be invariant under uh, how you're going to define the proper time. And the BRC symmetry governs the quantization of physical systems in the presence of gauge symmetries, controlling both renormalizability and anomalies. Um, the BRC symmetry does that by introducing more fields than those we would expect from classical mechanics. These fields are called ghosts. Geometrically, these variables parameterize the components of the gauge connections along fibers in the principal bundle. So if you don't understand this, there's no problem. It's just that there's a geometric understanding of ghosts. They are not like, a, it's a bad name or not. It might be a good name or not. So uh, cohomology. Um, so the BRC symmetry is characterized as a new potent fermionic symmetry. Uh, which is a symmetry that if you act twice on everything, uh, it's going to give you zero. One replaces the Hubert space with uh, BRST cochain complexes. So this picture here, it somehow uh, improved it. Um, by 
considering something which looks like uh, let's see if I Where every time uh, you walk, you walk uh, twice, uh, you get you, you land at zero of, of the respective f. So if you are in f1, you take some object like uh, psi one. This will be mapped to q psi one, and this will be mapped to zero. Uh, so this uh, it's a mathematical construction. Uh, it's actually a mathematical construction that belongs to uh, linear algebra, so it really something uh, that you can put your hands and compute. It's not something abstract, even though most people try to present this uh, by thinking in abstract terms. But uh, this is actually something very concrete, and it's like a technology. One can view this as a as a as a as the ultimate technology of dealing with linear spaces. Um, and in, indeed, uh, what is good what is good about this this way of describing. Uh, not just physics, but any ob mathematical object, um, is that uh, it can describe its own deformations. So if you want to describe the deformations of this object, you need to do what's called cohomology, which is looking at the states that are annihilated by the symmetry. So the states like in, that doesn't pass through here, so where this is already zero, But then it turns out that there are trivial solutions to this equation because any state uh, any state that is written as q of something, if you act q of psi one, you get zero because q is square zero. So one quotient by this trivial solutions of this equation. So one can view this equation as constraints and this equation as gauging variances. Um, Okay, so the BRC symmetry uh, as a fundamental sy uh, symmetry of physics uh, was stressed in 82 by Balio and, and Thierry Miyagi and further developed by Siegel in 85 and then Witten in 86. Uh, these two works was in string field theory, but they uh, all the time uh, say that what, what they're talking about is general enough. It's not just for string theory, but for all relativistic systems. So e even though uh, this emphasis can be viewed by most pr practitioners as minor technologies, uh, profound results in quantum field theory, such as a work of Balio in 2010 and Costello Lee in 2015, comes from emphasizing this BRC symmetry. And indeed, the combination between these two works results in the quantization of an over-normalizable field theory known as Kodaira Spencer or BCOV theory, establishing the twist holography program, which is an ongoing problem uh, that I'm going to discuss in the mid, uh, at the end of the talk. Typically, uh, in normalizable theories, both the space of obstructions and the space of counter terms are infinite dimension, the, the infinite dimensional. And what this BRC symmetry does in this particular context is to kill one, one against the other. So the space of obstructions are kill, uh, 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 I mean, every, yeah. If you try to construct a theory without anomalies, you are eventually going to fix all the counter terms, all the con because there are infinite number of anomalies that you need to avoid. Um, okay, so now uh, let me discuss a concrete example, which is the spinless uh, particle. So a covariantly quant to covariantly quantize this uh, spinless particle, we consider the embedding of its path in space-time and integrate over paths interpolating between events. And then to calculate uh, probabilities, one must close a time loop, like going back and forth, uh, to generate traces, like I wrote there, uh, with insertions at the respective events. So the uh, insertions of the events will be some projectors, but without summing over them. I mean, you are free to sum, but you don't need to. Uh, due to the reparameterization variance of embeddings, a BRC complex will form, as I said before, and the physics is concentrated in the cohomology of this BRC complex. So uh, the object that appears when you try to quantize the spinless particle is the word lines. Uh, and to ensure the decoupling from the proper time, uh, 
the word line necessarily possess a B ghost, which is a, 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 some variable with ghost number minus one that satisfy equation 15, where this Hamiltonian in 15 is the Hamiltonian that generates a proper time. So what this equation is saying is just that if you try to deform proper time, this is going to be a Q-exact deformation, a deformation that uh, a deformation that physics doesn't change, doesn't kill. So, um, and notice that uh, uh, this makes the theory topological. So, because the, the structure, the kind of a metric of proper time that you're using to, to discuss distance between operators uh, in this line here, uh, doesn't matter because it's a uh, it's it's a Q exact deformation. And indeed, by parametrization, you can make two points very close to each other. But you can never change the order of points in a circle. So there'll be still some structure. And uh, indeed, uh, one can notice that even though relativistic quantum mechanics is a topological theory in a time direction, if you set Hamiltonian to zero, because then there'll be no unitary operators on the line, there'll be just operators uh, 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 like emission operators attached to points on the line. And uh, and, and the first topological, so the only thing that matters is the order of the operators on the line is going to produce the commutation relations. And indeed, uh, by looking carefully at the action of the non relativistic quantum mechanics or the relativistic quantum mechanics, one can uh, extract these algebras from, from path integral way of, of looking at, at things. And uh, yeah. So uh, it is very natural to consider um, generalizations of the particle. An obvious generalization is to increase the proper dimension. So one can imagine instead of a pointing particle, something that has inner structure. And uh, uh, however, quantization becomes ex increasingly uh, challenging as we transition from particles, which is word lines, to strings, which are word sheets. I'm going to discuss about them. And even harder if you go to membranes, that uh, we get a bunch of instabilities, and these are supposedly described by matrix models. And I don't want to, to discuss that because I don't understand them. Um, OK. So I'm going to talk about the strings because this is the thing I understand. I mean, <laughs> I understand better the matrix models. Uh, we have uh, learned deep lessons about quantum mechanics and space time by looking carefully at the quantization of the relativistic string. So unlike the relativistic particle, uh, the quantization of relativistic strings seems to govern its entire background. So for any linearized deformation of the background, there corresponds uh, a string excitation that describes it, including deformations of the background metric. So that means that the theory is inevitably a theory of gravity. But it, it's more than that. It's a theory that uh, any deformation of the background, it's somehow described by small excitations of the string. So the str so this coupling between a relativistic string and a background, it's full of anomalies and full of, uh, it's, it's a very, uh, uh, it's, it's, the, there's a rich structure there, which tells a lot about background, not just the relativistic string. And that's why uh, it teaches connections between quantum mechanics and space time. Amplitudes. So the instructions on how to deform the free theory. So let me just review that. Uh, Hamiltonians in first quantization, that's also true for actions. When you go to second quantization, uh, you get something like this, plus deformations. So it turns out that for relativistic systems, those deformations, uh, I mean, if if you want the theory to be interacting, these deformations must be turned on. So one must, uh, of course, uh, one must departure for, from first quantization if one wants to describe interactions, at least not perturbatively. But perturbatively, it is possible. And uh, indeed, most of what it, it's done in string theory uh, is perturbatively, at, uh, yeah, or using field theory, but field theory is not string theory. Uh, OK, so, um, so, this, so the amp, the, the, what's called the amplitude prescription are uh, prescriptions that tells you how you're going to deform the free theory using the first quantization scheme without going to second quantization. It's going to produce some series that that usually doesn't converge. 
it's an asymptotic series, but the asymptotic series is actually very good because they converge faster until they start to diverge. <laughs> so they get so fast close to the answer that they, they escape. Um, and that's why we get so, so much success on QED. It's because the series is asymptotic. If it was a convergent series, it would not converge so fast. Uh, so unlike particles, the symmetries underlying relativistic strings are powerful enough to uniquely fix the amplitude prescriptions. So for particles, we need an additional gradient, which is randomizability. With that, then you can uh, reduce the amount of, uh, of, of constructing instructions uh, for amplitude prescriptions to a finite dimensional space, where the, 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 this finite dimensional space is the space of confluence of the theory. So, uh, but in order to, to have this for particles, you need randomizability. Now for string theory, you get the symmetry, so you don't need that. And, and, and indeed, the theory is UV finite. And this is attributed to a crucial subset of the asymmetries known as the moduli invariance, which maps any potential UV divergence to a ER divergence. So essentially, it's the following. So uh, the picture is that uh, if you get uh, so some strings merging at some sphere, and you get some very small handle, one can map using the symmetry to a, a very thin tube with strings. So what was UV here becomes infrared. So uh, that's the picture that's good to have in mind. Uh, and uh, it turns out that this modular invariance is also crucial for canceling certain anomalies in space time. So it's quite interesting to see that these things go hand by hand, the randomizability and anomalies. Um, so tachyons. So the simplest string uh, with the simplest background is known as the bosonic string in flat background. Computationally, it consists in operations with free conformal field theories on Riemann surfaces, like these curves I read. Uh, I write. Uh, those are Riemann surfaces. Uh, um, these operations will be the building blocks for the constructions of a second quantized action. Okay. Uh, alternately, tachyonic modes in the spectrum signal that the coupling between the bosonic string and the background and the flat background is unstable. So. Um, that means that one cannot do first quantization that, because even if you try to do perturbation theory, it, 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 it will have instability. So yeah, but one can do second quantization. So it's not completely useless. So it is useful for second quantization, but yeah, it's hard to describe this in first quantization. And indeed, uh, there are a bunch of conjectures which was done by uh, Shoxin in 98 and most of these conjectures are now uh, uh, shown to be, uh, uh, I mean, at some degree of occurrence, uh, are, are been checked by using second quantization by the program called string field theory, which I'm not going to talk about. So there are a different type of generalization one can consider of, of relativistic systems, which is uh, spinning. One can uh, make the object spinning. So the, the, the first quantization of relativistic systems Spinning objects arise from considering the supersymmetrization of the parameterization variance. So that's a thing not everyone knows. Uh, and and th this starts in 76, uh, uh, when fermionic particles spin one half were constructed based on n equals one word line supersymmetry. So what this su supersymmetry means is that instead of having the proper time, you also have a fermionic parameter, which are called kappa, that satisfy kappa square equals zero. Um, and it turns out that uh, with these parameters, I can construct an algebra of, uh, uh, of, of symmetries, like something like that. Uh, up to factors of two, which I'm not being careful about. Um, so you can you can find this 
algebra, and this algebra is known as uh, n equals one uh, word line supersymmetry. And uh, yes, so um, okay, so let me explain because it, it seems yeah it's not entirely obvious why uh, we're going to obtain spinning spinning particles. So. So spinning particles are described by Dirac equation. So we need to find where the Dirac operator appears. Uh, and indeed, uh, this action is written as an integral over proper time. I'm not going to use the fermionic parameter because it to, uh, I need to introduce more ideas to talk about the, this parameter. So I'm going to use a, a different form. Uh, Um, so it's something like that. So that's the action of n equals one word line supersymmetry. Um, so this part is essentially the symplectic part, is the PQ part. So this is like the. Uh, the PDQ part, and these are uh, Lagrange, Lagrange multipliers imposing constraints. And this constraint turns out after you, you look at the algebra generated by this term, it's going to become a, a deliberation operator, and this is going to become the Dirac operator. So the Psi essentially plays the role of a gamma matrices it's like a, 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 the way that the word line is going to construct the gamma matrix in the second quantization. And uh, the momenta is, of course, the derivative in the space. Um, and indeed, uh, this was generalized in 88 to all values of spin by constructing any word line supersymmetry. So you essentially add more fermionic variables that amounts to putting labels here, like an I here and here, where I runs from one to N. And uh, here get an I and an I. And indeed one can check that uh, this, so this will get an I and uh, you satisfy this algebra. So, uh, okay, so in 71, uh, uh, Green, Schwarz, and then Ramon, they generalize this to the string. They construct the spinning string uh, using n equals one word sheet supersymmetry. Uh, and then in 76, the n equals two string were introduced. So, uh, twisting. So, um, in 91, we are encouraged to construct the BRC charge uh, as a linear combination of word sheet supercharges instead of gauging the n equals two word sheet supersymmetry. So instead of considering these as constraints, introducing Lagrangian multipliers and then apply BRC machinery, uh, he proposed to take one of the supercharges or linear combinations of those, which is this partial slash, uh, to be the BRC charge. And uh, this gives this n equals two twisted word sheet supersymmetry. And he used it, uh, this machine to construct the A and the B model. So the first quantization of these systems corresponds computationally to very interesting mathematical problems, the counting of rational curves and the periods of differential forms. And in mathematics and now also in physics, there's a symmetry between these two models, which is called mirror symmetry. Uh, more generally, through the process of twisting n equals two word sheet supersymmetry, one obtains the so-called n equals two topological strings, which are not necessarily in B model. So in 1994, the n equals four topological strings were constructed by Berkowitz and Waffa. So now gets, things get very, we get a bunch of strings and particles and one wants to organize things. And there's an hierarchical structure organizing all the systems. So at least, the strings. 
So uh, in 193, Berkowitz and Waffa show this hierarchical structures among the untwisted Wurtsch supersymmetries, meaning the spinning strings. So and indeed, the bosonic string, which is the one that has tachyons, can be uh, viewed as a n equals one spinning string in some particular background, some uh, a special class of backgrounds. And the same can be said from, for n equals one spinning string being embedded in n equals two spinning string. So that reveals that n equals two spinning string is somehow more fundamental because all the other spinning strings are obtained from, from that. Uh, in 1992, it was observed that bosonic strings are governed uh, by n equals two topological strings. Uh, so we also have this relation with twisted. So bosonic strings uh, can be viewed as n equals two, as a particular class of n equals two topological uh, strings. And in 1994, it was observed that n equals two spinning strings are governed by the n equals four topological string. So that means that uh, n equals four topological strings, uh, uh, it, 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 it covers almost all theories. Uh, uh. So um, now, so uh, like the spinning particles, spinning strings have an additional structure feature uh, known as the spin structure. So in, in viewing the trajectory of a, of a string as a Riemann surface, so let me write down it here. So, so let's say you get a closed string propagating the space time. So this is time, some particular frame. Um, since you got an extra dimension, one can consider uh, rotations of, of spinners al along the, the spatial proper time direction. And when it is instructions, if the spinner is going to get a plus sign or minus sign, because spinners does not need to go back to itself under rotation. So um, this instruction, th this set of instructions is uh, discrete data. And uh, modular invariance turns out to fix how you're going to deal with this discrete data. And indeed, instruct by some over this discrete data with appropriate weights. And after summing over the spin structures, a new symmetry previously hidden from us emerges. And this symmetry is the space-time supersymmetry. And the projected objects, the objects that uh, appear after you sum over spin structures, is the superstring. So, uh, uh, yeah. So when you sum over spin structures, you are essentially projecting states because there's some choice of external states that is going to be in the kernel of the particular sum you're doing. So that's why I said projected. And uh, only recently, uh, in 2021, Berkowitz was able to uh, make this super space-time supersymmetry manifest uh, in a spinning description of, of the string. The way he did, it was by constructing a dynamical twist, mapping the n equals one spinning description to the n equals two twisted description. And this n equals two twisted description of the superstring is known as the pure spinner formalism. In 2005, it was proposed. Um, okay, so now I'm going to talk about the superstrings. Uh, in 1995, a comprehensive overview emerged concerning the various types of superstrings. So you get, uh, it's a finite number of them. We get type 2a, type 2b, type 1, SO32 heterotic, key 88 heterotic, and that's it. And there's some weird thing which we don't really understand what is happening at 11 dimensions, but it's quite crucial to go there to, you know, to interpolate all these this theories. Um, so they look like different corners, different perturbation theories of the same theory. That's what the, over, the compressive overview really is. Um, the pure spin of formalism, um, Okay, so the, the superstrings are uniquely among other relativistic systems as they describe quantum gravity around stable backgrounds. The simplest of these stable backgrounds are governed by 10 dimensional supergravities at low energies. And indeed, this supergravities is what we use to name the types of strings. 
In 1991, the pure spinor formalism was developed as an organizing principle for 10 dimensional supergravities. It involves formulating the supergravity equations as follows. It's a very simple equation, uh, where this nabla represents a connection in a configuration space of closed strings embedded in superspace. And lambda denotes a dynamical pure spinner. So uh, yeah, like if, I, if, 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 if you think up very hard about this, these words, you're going to construct other supergravity equations out of this. Uh, you just need to make sense of what the configuration space of a closed string is, which is a loop, loop superspace. And then, yeah, and then you start to do it, you're eventually going to construct uh, supergravity equations. Uh, uh, merging merging this, uh, these ideas of how with Siegel, uh, the pure spinner formula for the worksheet was developed by Berkowitz in 2000 uh, by proposing this n equals two topological description. So it turns out that in 2000, he didn't use the n equals two topological description. It was a much more complicated description. And then only in 2005 that he uh, uh, organized all this uh, 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 ad hoc description into n equals to twisted description. So that's why it's a little bit confusing. Um, OK, so I'm going to talk about uh, the brains. So the, in 1995, the deep brains were introduced. Uh, these are locations in the background where the superstring might terminate. They necessarily lead to open strings, as closed strings might unfold in the presence of these objects. So you can imagine a closed string getting close to the deep brain and then open up at the deep brain. The open superstrings uh, with any points attached to the deep brains govern the dynamics of the deep brains. Like I said before, uh, that the relativistic uh, strings, any deformation of the background are captured by modes of the string. So if you want to deform these deep brains, these deformations will be governed by these open strings. And it was conjectured that this theory uh, is a, some kind of no abelian generalization of uh, Dyson uh, of DBI action. Um, so these D brains, they are charges of a field called Ramon Ramon field. And the coupling between the superstring and the Ramon Ramon fields within the spinning formulation is unknown. So that's an open problem. And it's a very difficult problem. People have been working on this for, for years. and. Only recently there are some developments, but yeah. Uh, in, in stacking many D brains, one can either examine the low energy of open strings attached to the D brains, resulting in a gauge fear description, which is can be viewed as a low energy approximation of this DBI action, uh, or one can first compute the back reaction of the Roman Roman flux emanating from the stack, which punctures the space time geometry. So if you try to compute the, the space time uh, back reaction, it's going to puncture it, the space time and the deep brains disappear. And th there's no open strings anymore, only closed strings. Uh, in the path integral approach, it's more natural to work in weak rotated space times and worksheets. This unifies various quantizations, which are now described by choices of time through finality continuation. Uh, and in this picture, so if you have two deep brains, you, you get two different ways of understanding this computation. One can understand that you're computing a propagator for a closed string that borns one D brain and then ends at the other D brain. Or one can understand this computation as a partition function of open strings with any points attached to these D brains, interpolating them. Uh, that's actually uh, the, the microscopic origin of quantum holography and uh, the relation between super strings and gauge theories. So this, the superstring in ADS factors S5 is conjectured to be dual to maximally supersymmetric gauge theory in four dimensions, precisely because of these two ways of, of, of viewing the system. Um, the n equals four, d equals four super n mu's Feynman diagrams governs the zero radius limit of type to be superstrings in ADS factors S5. And the type 2B superstrings in ADS factors S5 govern n equals 4 equals 4 super n mu's at strong coupling in the large n limit. One can use superstrings as, as, as a novel way of approaching strongly coupled gauge theories. By starting with a maximally supersymmetric situation, one can learn which properties are consequences of supersymmetry 
and which properties are more general, with the ultimate goal of understanding gauge theories. So now one can view string theory as, a, as, a, as an attempt of understanding gauge theories and its relation to gravity, and not as a theory of everything or whatever. So superstrings A dash factors S5. Due to the sum over spin structures, the spinning formulation of the superstring is not suitable for describing Ramon Ramon backgrounds, as I mentioned before. Here, the n equals to topological description of the superstring proposed by Nathan Berkowitz, but pure spin formalism, is necessary. In 2004, the description of the coupling between the superstring and the ADS factors S5 was established using the pure spin formalism. It was shown that the quantization is consistent for all orders of alpha prime, which is play the roles of H bar in the first quantization. And, and the worksheet theory is integrable. That's also shown in this paper. And then uh, recently, Shanji and Gomiji did a first step uh, in relating this n equals two topological description of Ramon Ramon backgrounds with n equals one spinning description. So now I'm going to mention the current stage uh, of superstrings ADS access five. Of course, I'm just taking one slice of a huge uh, uh, angles one can attack this problem. So the the current stage in this particular slice I'm taking is uh, in one in 2012, Fleury uh, constructed vertex operators near boundary, and uh, so it was approximation. And then in 2015, Azevedo and Berkowitz uh, used this construction to compute certain scattering amplitudes. Uh, and then in 2021, uh, Ferry and me, uh, we constructed ground states for the how BPS vertex operators in ADS factors S5 background uh, without any approximation. And now work is in progress uh, with Fleury and Zavaleta in being uh, uh, in here in I IAP UF UFRN with the aim of computing scattering amplitudes using these fully constructed vertices. So the general picture is like that. We constructed the string entering into the ADS. Now what we want to do is to add more strings and eventually merging them and construct uh, figures like this one. So, and this is going to describe a uh, strong coupling uh, regime of gauge fears supersymmetric, maximum supersymmetric gauge fears a priori. So now I'm going to talk about the topological strings. So um, it turns out that um, from the path integral perspective, the no relativistic uh, 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 quantum mechanics, one can make it a topological theory by taking the Hamiltonian to be zero and then one insert the unitary operators as defects in the theory, in the topological theory. So they are not really part of the action. There are some insertion you do in the, in the correlator. Um, and it turns out that if you want to make this very precise, if you want to path integrate over this theory, you need to deal with questions of uh, convergence because you are integrating over uh, phases. So that's, of course, a barely convergent theory, uh, uh, integral. You need to improve convergence by analytic continuation of the dynamics. So you continue, you analytic continue the dynamical variables, and then uh, uh, you try to. There's a whole syst uh, systematic approach for constructing integration cycles in the complexified space of dynamical variables that's going to produce co uh, convergent path integrals. Uh, these are called for those that like to. I mean, that one might be curious about. Uh, called left shed symbols. And if you do that, if you do this uh, um, careful analysis, one discovers that uh, the when we need to integrate over loops on the phase on the complexified phase space, um, that are boundary values of pseudo Riemann surfaces, uh, pseudo Lamarck Riemann surfaces. Sorry. So, the, uh, so what this means, I think it's better to draw uh, that uh, if you want to, so we get the phase space, 
and then you 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 complexify the phase space and you want to consider contours and these contours turns out to correspond to boundary values of something which is two dimensional where the, the the for each point in this contour there is a loop because you're integrating over loops. You're computing traces. And uh, it, turns, it, it turns out that if you try to improve convergence of the path integral, you essentially fill, fill in the, the, the loops into disks. And uh, one, one can ask if there is a, 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 a worksheet theory or a string theory governing this. And indeed, the answer is yes. And this theory is the A model. Is the is the topolo is a topo any consul topological string that new that Witten discovered, um, and indeed the way to to do is to we need to delocalize this pseudolomorphic curves to become dynamical. So one can uh, think that uh, one can path integrate over all uh, disks, and 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 then construct things such that the path integral localize at uh, at disks which are pseudolomorphic maps. Uh, this is like an ongoing program. It's called quantization by brains or probing quantization by brains. They're worked by Gayot and Witten in 2021 and Gukov and Witten in 2009. Uh, now I'm going to give you an application of the B model, which is another topological theory. Uh, so in 2015, Costello and Lee uh, they established the second quantization of open closed BCOV theory, which is essentially the, the second quantization version of the closed string of B model, uh, open and closed. So, it, b beside the fact that the theory is not renormalizable, so th they, uh, f they show that this infinite number of counter terms of non renormalizable theories are constellated against an infinite number of potential anomalies using BRST cohomology. So that's what I said before, the BRC emphasis in BRC symmetry is important because you catch these kinds of things. And uh, in 190, uh, I'm sorry, in 2016, Costello and Lee uh, used this BCOV theory to make sense of uh, a more general idea called a twisted supergravity, which is essentially a generalization of this twist procedure by Witten in supergravity context. And then in 2018, Costell and Gayotto uh, reformulated this, uh, I mean, th th they take advantage of these twisted supergravities to construct what's called the um, to twist theology. Which, which is conjecturally, it captures a topological sector of ADS5 cross S5 holography, which is the holography I was saying before. Uh, and then in 2022, these ideas of twist holography were used to improve computations in QCD. So that's an application of topological strings. So since I have a little bit of time, before concluding, I'm going to discuss double copy, which is something not. It, it does, it's something more general than what I'm saying, but it, 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 it uh, I think it corroborates with the picture I want to, to give. Uh, so the double copy was discovered by a property called left-right factorization. So in flat backgrounds, the excitations of a string factorize into left and right movers. And consequently, closed string states can be described by left-right products of open, string states. So the way to see it is that, uh, so if you're in a flat background, you get a circle and uh, so let's suppose get a closed string in a flat background, you can have a mode that is, is a left mover and you can have a mode that is left mover and they pass to each other, it's a linear in flat background. Um, now, if you consider an open string, there is boundary. So a mode will reflect at the boundary. So it, 
So the left movers and the right movers will be related because of the boundary conditions. But they're related in such a way that you can make one dominant and the other one a slave. So you can make the left movers dominate over the left, over the right movers, or vice versa. And, and then because of that, uh, you get that uh, you can take one open string governed by left movers, one open string governed by right movers, and then one can construct the closed string by taking the product of two open strings. And uh, that's something that you see in the construction of vertex operators, in the computation of scattering amplitudes, um, and even at this level of constructing second quantized actions. If you uh, now, this is a string theory thing, but if you take the low energy limit, the string becomes just some particular choice of ultraviolet regulator and field theory is supposed to be independent of these choices if the theory is renormalizable. So by taking the low energy limit of the string theories, you start to see this left factorization survive, it persists for, our for, for most theories. So we get uh, uh, something which, some structure, some piece of structure, which is very hard to see by working with the usual quantum field theory framework. But if you, if you use the string, th this relativistic strings as ultraviolet regulators of the thing you are talking about, you're going to, to, to see this structure. Uh, so, this is not by now uh, being generalized. So th there is SHY formula, which uh, is string inspired equations for scattering amplitudes and color kinematics duality. And this established the double copy program. This program involves photo investigation into this left right factorization in the space of theories, serving as both as organization principle and practical tools for improving computations. So for instance, you get some multiplication table where we get left and right. And if you take like some quantum field theory as the left mover and some other quantum field, field, some quantum field theory as the right mover, it's going to produce some theory inside this multiplication table. So you see Young Mills square is equal gravity. It's not just gravity. So this plus means that it's gravity plus some diloton, which is a scalar field and the B field, which is an anti-symmetric two form. And uh, yeah, and, and supersymmetry is additive in this product. So if you, one side has supersymmetry, the other one doesn't, you get uh, the amount of the, the addition of supersymmetries from the left and, and the right. So you see four, four gives eight. Um, and you see there's even theories which are kind of neutral. They, they are, if you take young mules with this theory, it gives young mules again. Like the identity of this multiplication table. So, uh, so now I'm going to conclude. So, the first quantization of relativistic systems invite us to consider more general topological theories than the ones governing quantum mechanics. Uh, among other relativistic systems, the superstring catches our attention because it governs its own background in a stable fashion. All the other choices has stacks, so you can really approach from the first quantization perspective. And this also makes the theory inevitably a theory of quantum gravity. So, so both superstrings and topological strings play crucial roles in establishing unexpected and meaningful connections between gauge theories and gravity, as I said before, like open closed duality, holography, double copy. Uh, the A model governing non-relativistic quantum mechanics, the B model uh, uh, being used to make sense of non-renormalizable non quantum field theories that are used to, to eventually improve computation in QCD by this twist holography. Um, despite notable success, it is essential to recognize the existence of unsolvable, uh, unresolved issues in the foundational understanding of superstring and topological strings, particularly regarding the intricate interplay between the two under twisting. So you see that uh, a, a twisted description is described, uh, I mean, one can describe the superstring by uh, n equals one spinning or by n equals two twisted. And this uh, map, it's very recent, so, uh, sorry. Whoa. Um, 
no, sorry. Yeah, like 2021, and it, it's something that's going on, this understanding of this dynamical twist. So, um, so now I will end. Uh, yeah. Okay, so thanks a lot. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Lux, for this, for, for the great colloquium, and we can move to questions. Uh, are there any questions? Okay. Hi, thanks for the talk. So I was wondering what kind of physical phenomena are you trying to, un to describe with this kind of approach that just regular quantum mechanics cannot? Mm. Okay, so any situation you get gauge symmetries, any, any, I mean, one can of course go to unitary gates all the time. Like if you want to compute scattering amplitudes of uh, massless particles, with spin one, uh, one can try to do everything in the unitary gauge. But uh, if you try to do it, it's it's a mess. It, it gets ugly because the loading symmetry, since you're imposing unitary to symmetry, loading symmetry now it's something that needs to be checked. It's not something that uh, there be a bunch of all the anomalies that were before in this reparameterization variance in the beer, that is organized by the BRC symmetry is now everything uh, uh, in, uh, in the loading symmetry. And Lorentz symmetry is where our intuition is based. So we lose completely how you're going to approach the system. And yeah, the description gets very complicated. And there are computations, but they they cannot go as far as you go if you go if you do covariant quantization. But more importantly, you miss some things like BCOV theory. Like you're not going to see BCOV theory by just the usual way of thinking of quantum mechanics like Hilbert spaces and unitary operators. So where is PCOV? Yeah, like, um, and indeed, it, it eventually, this BCOV theory eventually has a use in, 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 in your daily lives. Because in your daily lives, we want to compute things in QCD and uh, and indeed, I would say that uh, most, I mean, at, at least my main motivation for studying superstring was never because it's a fear of quantum gravity. Or it was really to understand uh, strong coupling in quantum mechanics in the context of relativistics. I see, thank you. Which computation is this one in PCD? Oh, I, 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 yeah, I, 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 it's, some, it's a two loop uh, a computation, but I don't know, yeah, I don't know so, enough details by head, but it's a it's 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 a tough computation. It's some it, it's perturbative computation. It's two loop. I do, I don't remember how many external states. But yeah, I, I can say something more useful than that. So uh, this work they essentially uh, mapped some particular types of computations in QCD to some uh, mathematical object that's this vertex operator algebra, which is this Carl stuff. Yeah, this, so, yeah. In a way, they organize the, the computation. Like they recognize what is the right mathematical object to deal with the, instead of final diagrams. Yeah, but I, I don't know precisely the computation. Are there any more questions? Uh, yes, um, so this is supposed to be the, uh, uh, I mean, th this is conjectural uh, and it's, uh, it was this open closed BCOV supposed to describe, because this BCOV, it's a, it's a B model and it's going to describe to set up to be super gravity. And, and it's some kind of field theory, it's a normalizable field theory, but it nevertheless can be quantized. And it's going to describe uh, some sector in data circuit S5 that's annihilated by the supersymmetry that you're using to, to, to twist.
Yeah, I don't know. Uh, the, the only thing I know is that there will be directions that uh, will become topological and directions that become allomorphic when you do this twist. But I don't know if the field, if there's some field that is altogether uh, eliminated. I don't know. I have one more question about this double copy. I remember that there was some tension about uh, when you can put more points in a, because the idea is to promote an amplitude in young mills to amplitude in gravity, right? Yes. And uh, the, there are some tensions about uh, more points, like six points. I, I don't remember if this was. Mm, yeah, I wish you, I'm not aware. I, I in the, in the, What's the name? In, in the snow mass of the Bokopi, uh, they claim that uh, at three level, there's three uh, ways of approaching the Bokopi, which is CHY, color kinematics, or uh, low energy limits of bosonic string. They are they are agree at, at three level. And they didn't mention that, yeah, they don't mention that there are problems with higher points. I know that at loops, there are problems. Yeah, I, I, I don't. I, I'm not aware. Yeah, loops. I, I, yeah, loops. I, it's it's supposed to get wrong. more complicated. Yeah. Okay, so if there is no more questions, let's thank you. Oh.